In the year 1780, at a crisis point in the American Revolution, when American freedom and independence appeared to be a fading dream, there arose in the back country of South Carolina an extraordinary uprising by common men of uncommon courage, led in large part by an unlikely hero, the Swamp Fox of the Revolution. In the spring of 1780, the swampland of South Carolina's low country was still the trackless wilderness that had marked much of South Carolina for untold ages, and it gave no sign of the world-changing war that had shaken America for five bloody years. It was a war that had largely been fought elsewhere, much of it in the faraway north, on fields of fire with names like Bunker Hill, Saratoga, Harlem Heights, Trenton, Brandywine, and Monmouth Courthouse. America's patriot leaders had declared independence and nationhood, but five years of sustained warfare had not produced a final victory for what America's commander-in-chief, George Washington, called the sacred cause of freedom. In 1776, British forces had tried and failed to capture Charleston, and for five years, South Carolina had been spared the bloodshed that had marked the war in the North. But in 1780, with the war stalemated in the North and the state of Georgia conquered and occupied, the British high command again looked to South Carolina. The British had been fighting in the North for five years and had been largely unsuccessful. And there was a belief among the, um, the British that there was a large number of loyalists in the South, especially South Carolina. And if they moved their target down to uh, South Carolina, that the, um, these loyalists would rise up and support them. And at least if they could not take all their colonies back, they would end up uh, retaining the Southern colonies. In February of 1780, the British Army and Navy returned to South Carolina with overwhelming force. And again, British artillery was trained on Charleston, then the capital of South Carolina and the largest, most valuable port in the South. In May of 1780, overwhelmed by a naval blockade and a six-week siege, Charleston was captured by the British. Along with its superb harbor, huge stockpile of supplies and ammunition, and an entire American army. The fall of Charleston was the greatest American disaster in the war. With Charleston secure as a base of operations, the British moved swiftly through South Carolina, establishing fortified garrisons at Camden, 96, and Georgetown, with smaller outposts elsewhere. South Carolina appeared thoroughly conquered and would now become a base for the British strategy to advance into North Carolina and Virginia. It was a brilliant British triumph. In London, Britain's King George III celebrated the news of Charleston's capture with a parade of 4,000 British troops in Hyde Park. They come down and take Savannah, then they take uh, Charleston, they're going to come up through the Carolinas and Virginia and hit Washington from, from the south, end of the war. The occupation of South Carolina and the British Southern strategy were left in the hands of General Charles Cornwallis, an experienced and competent British officer who had played a major role in driving General George Washington's American army out of New York early in the war. A lot of these English officers had a tremendous disdain uh, for anyone who would rebel against the crown. British celebration over the occupation of South Carolina abruptly ended when General Cornwallis found his army mired in ferocious guerrilla warfare with a determined force of South Carolina citizen soldiers led by Francis Marion. In appearance, 
Marion looked anything like a hero. Depicted from memory in this painting by artist John Blake White, who knew him, Marion in 1780 was in his late 40s, a small, bow-legged, common-looking man known for his quiet and reserved nature. He was um, short in statue. I think he had dark hair. Uh, his nose was kind of a hooked nose. He wasn't like Washington, you know, tall, good shape, and you know, for a man of his age. And I just wonder if, you know, today if we saw him in a crowd of people, we would think he would be the type that would be what he was. He was not a loud, ambitious leader. Uh, he was very quiet. I think uh, his leadership came as a result of strong discipline, uh, being very firm, being fair. He hardly ever talked. Sometimes people are become great leaders simply by keeping their mouth shut, and I think he was pretty good at that. Born in 1732 on a plantation near Monk's Corner, South Carolina, Francis Marion was the youngest of six children, a planter's son, and like many South Carolinians, a descendant of French Huguenots who had fled France to escape persecution by the French monarchy for their Protestant faith. In 1572, more than 15,000 Huguenots had been slaughtered in a single day by French King Charles IX a bloody legacy that reportedly inspired some American Huguenots to be suspicious of any royalty. They suffered from the, from the hands of monarchy and, they, um, and then monarchy came over. <laughs> so they were probably uh, inclined to rebel. When he was five years old, Francis Marion's parents moved the family to a new home overlooking the backwaters of South Carolina's Winyaw Bay so young Marion could attend a free school in nearby Georgetown. There's really not a lot known about Ma Marion's early life or his family. They weren't the rich farmers, plantation owners. Uh, they were small. They had plantations, they had slaves, but they did not own tremendous amounts, rice culture, that sort of thing, kinds of slaves. According to legend, Marion went to sea as a teenager aboard a schooner, fulfilling a childhood dream of being a sailor. The dream was dashed, however, when Marion's ship was rammed by a whale, leaving the teenager stranded in the open sea in a lifeboat with other sailors. Before they were rescued by a passing ship, several men died, and young Marion had lost his yearning for the sailor's life. Instead, he took up his father's profession as a planter, running a modest plantation called Pond Bluff in South Carolina's Berkeley County. During the French and Indian War, he joined a military campaign into South Carolina's western frontier, serving as a lieutenant of militia. In the mountains and hollows of Cherokee country, he learned the harsh reality of war. At one point, as he and his troops followed orders to burn a Cherokee cornfield, he was reportedly moved to tears when he observed the footprints left by young Indian children playing among the stalks of corn and realized how the actions of his troops would affect their lives. He also survived a bloody Cherokee ambush and learned firsthand techniques of Indian-style warfare that would later serve him well against the British in the Revolution. I think he learned how to uh, hide and ambush, which is going to be his great strategy uh, in those dark days of 1780 and 81. After the French and Indian War, Francis Marion returned to the life of a bachelor planter, but he remained an officer in the colony's militia and served in South Carolina's Provincial Congress. In 1775, as increasing numbers of Americans came to view King George III as a tyrant determined to usurp their God-given or inalienable rights, tensions between America and Great Britain reached a kindling point at the village of Lexington near Boston. There, British troops opened fire on assembled Massachusetts militiamen and triggered the Revolutionary War. 
A year later in 1776, just days before the Continental Congress in Philadelphia voted for American independence, British forces made their first attack on Charleston. There, at the Battle of Sullivan's Island, Francis Marion, by then a major in the South Carolina line, played a major role in defeating and driving away the British. As the war waged in the North, Marion remained in South Carolina on garrison duty as a lieutenant colonel in the Continental Army. And in 1779, he commanded South Carolina's 2nd Regiment in a failed campaign to drive the British out of Savannah. When the British returned to Charleston in 1780 and captured the city and its defenders, they did not capture Francis Marion due to a peculiar event. Marion had joined the men of his regiment in a party at this Charleston house. The party had turned into a drinking spree. The traditional thing was that you would uh, start drinking after your meal and keep drinking into the night. The heavy drinking made Marion increasingly uncomfortable because he seldom drank anything alcoholic. His preferred beverage was vinegar and water. He carried a canteen of water mixed with vinegar which I think had some health benefits. It's also uh, ancient used by the Roman soldiers. When the party host locked all the doors to keep the festivities going, that was enough for Marion. He threw open a second floor window and jumped to the street below. When he landed, he turned his ankle. He was in bad shape then because he could hardly walk. And so he left the city to go recuperate at a plantation. And that is when the British came in just by coincidence, and took the city and ended up capturing all of the army, except for the few that were out of town, which Marion was one of. Meanwhile, Major General Horatio Gates had been sent south by the Continental Congress to head a Continental Army charged with driving the British out of South Carolina. Gates was heralded as the hero of the Battle of Saratoga in upstate New York, where the British had surrendered an entire army in 1777. But some in the army believed Gates was overrated as a commander. He was very, he, he was ambitious. He wanted Washington's job. I think it was a pompous, pompous fool. I don't know, I don't think he knew where he was headed or what he was facing. Marion and a handful of militia rode to North Carolina to join Gates in the Continental Army. General Gates and his staff were reportedly amused and unimpressed by the scruffy appearance of Marion and his men. Instead of including them in his planned offensive, he ordered them back to the South Carolina Low Country to disrupt supply lines on the region's roads and rivers. And the old story is that Gates and his Continentals thought these ragged South Carolinians looked so bad, they were sent on a mission back home to destroy boats and confiscate horses. After Marion and his men departed, Gates engaged General Cornwallis and his British Army in battle outside Camden, with disastrous results. On August 16, 1780, at the Battle of Camden, Gates ineptly deployed his troops, and Cornwallis smashed and destroyed his army. Gates personally fled the field, deserting his surviving troops and reportedly not stopping until safely back in North Carolina. As for Francis Marion, for the second time, first at Charleston and now at Camden, he had escaped capture with a defeated army. With his second-in-command and longtime friend Peter O'Ree, for whom South Carolina's O'Ree County is named, Marion set out to upset British control of the South Carolina Low Country between the Santee and the P.D. Rivers. Militia soldiers were farmers, fathers, uh, and, and shopkeepers and craftsmen first and soldiers second. And so when a, when a militia soldier fell in, it was to defend his home and his farm and his community. And when the battle went elsewhere, he went back home. Uh, he couldn't deny that he had to protect his livelihood there. There was no one going to tend his corn crop, no one going to make sure that, that his place was protected. He was a kind and patient, generous officer, uh, a, a natural leader, 
without a doubt. And a man who was able to make that transition from being uh, uh, leading his own regiment in the continental line to heading a band of ragged guerrillas in, in the swamps. Marion needed troops and supplies to effectively wage guerrilla warfare against the British, and he received both in the region that is now South Carolina's Williamsburg County. In 1780, the region was 900 square miles of swampland, forest, and fields, with the Black River at its center, the Santee River on its western rim, and the PD River to the east. And it was a hotbed of patriot support due to its large population of Scots-Irish, whose ancestors had resisted English rule in Scotland and Ireland. Many of them came over here, settled in the Virginia backcountry, um, and then exploded southward toward down the Appalachian Trail and filled out the backcountry of North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, very independent. They were used to taking care of themselves and their own people, and they didn't want anybody telling them what to do. And when the British came along and started trying to force them to do the way they wanted them to do, it probably didn't go over well at all. In August of 1780, at Witherspoon Ferry on Lynch's River, near the modern town of Johnsonville, Francis Marion assumed command of the Williamsburg Militia, giving him about 60 troops, enough to form a rough brigade and take action, and he acted immediately. British troops were moving 147 American prisoners captured at the Battle of Camden on the road from Camden to Charleston. On August 20, 1780, at a site near Monk's Corner, Francis Marion and his men ambushed the British column at what became known as the Battle of Nelson's Ferry. They killed or captured 24 British troops and freed the American prisoners. Francis Marion became a hero to his fellow Americans, but he also earned the attention of General Cornwallis, who first tried to eliminate Marion by sending a force of 200 Loyalist militia troops after him. Marion did not wait for the Loyalist force to strike him, but instead he attacked first at the Battle of Blue Savannah, an action commemorated today by an historic sign on U.S. Highway 501 between the modern-day towns of Conway and Marion. Nearby, at a site alongside what is now Highway 41 in a modern-day cemetery, Marion and about 50 men launched a surprise attack on an encampment of Loyalist troops commanded by Major Micah Jagani. In the Battle of Blue Savannah, Francis Marion's unit, unit came in, hit them once, disrupted them, took off only to go around the curve and wait for them to catch up. And when they came in off guard, they got hit by the full force and in fact lost the Battle of Blue Savannah. Francis Marion was not the only guerrilla warfare leader in South Carolina. Colonel Andrew Pickens battled the British in South Carolina's upcountry, and Brigadier General Thomas Sumter was active in the state's Midlands, although neither officer affected the war in South Carolina as much as Marion or matched his fame. To kill or capture Marion and to discourage guerrilla warfare throughout the state, General Cornwallis unleashed a force of more than 1,000 British and Loyalist troops, led by Major James Weems and the British 63rd Regiment of Foot. But Marion escaped, retreating through Horry County into North Carolina. In guerrilla warfare, or partisan warfare, you don't win or lose big battles. It's this constant skirmishing, win or lose, survival. That's, to me, his major contribution. Unable to capture or kill Marion and his men, Major Weems unleashed a campaign of terror in September of 1780, burning homes, barns, and mills on a march that began northwest of Georgetown in Williamsburg County and extended up the west side of the PD River all the way to the town of Chihuahua. It was a trail of terror and destruction 15 miles wide and 70 miles long. More than 50 homes were put to the torch, from backwoods cabins to plantation manors. Weems and his troops left a smoldering trail of desolation 
in their wake across the PD region. Complete desolation, complete desolation, all the way up to, uh, uh, to, to the fall line. Just complete, complete devastation. People are living off nothing. There is nothing left. At one point, Weems reportedly locked the wife and children of a Patriot officer in a bedroom of their home for two days without food and water in an attempt to force the officer to come in and surrender. When the coercion failed, he freed the family, but then burned their house. The British also burned churches. Indian Town Presbyterian Church near King Street was one of many Presbyterian and other dissenter churches that were burned by the British during the Revolution because their members had a history of resisting royal rule. Churches were the centers of communities and you, that's part of destroying the culture of the people who are there, uh, is to destroy the church, the center point of their community. In an attempt to suppress rising Patriot support in South Carolina, the British ordered all able-bodied men to join the Loyalist militia. If they fled, their homes were destroyed. If they were caught, they were hanged. There were a lot more executions and hangings by the British than, than have made it into the history books. The brutal strategy employed by the British occupation troops under Major Weems and others did not, however, terrorized the people of South Carolina as the British had hoped. Instead, it had the opposite effect. When you start attacking people's homes and burning their homes, you know, the hatred is, I mean, it's getting very personal then. And it just drove the local South Carolinians over to the Patriot side in droves. If they had not burned those churches, burned those houses, uh, and hanged a lot of uh, patriots, I think it might have been different. In retaliation to the British war on civilians, some patriot South Carolinians went on a burning spree of their own, setting fire to the homes of loyalist families. This was a civil war in South Carolina. It's neighbor against neighbor. I'm confident a lot of old um, grievances and vendettas were, were played out in that war. Marion would have none of it. He would not allow his men to burn and loot, and he condemned those who did. That was part of his sense of honor, I think, as a soldier and a gentleman. When Marion sent out couriers calling for troops, they came, angered by the British brutality and determined to drive the British Occupation Army out of South Carolina. They went into battle with very little ammunition. Their swords were made out of cross-cut saws. They were half naked. We can't imagine how little they had. We came so close to losing it in South Carolina. Marion's men fought as cavalry or as mounted infantry, and a favorite weapon was a shotgun, fired up close at an enemy as a shock weapon. Marion's brigade seldom numbered more than about 60 men, but the Indian-style guerrilla warfare they waged was not the kind of combat the British Army had trained for back in Europe. You know, they couldn't catch him. He was hiding. You know, he would hit him and run, and they weren't used to that and didn't think very well of it. And um, it was just new war for them. It was something they were not used to. Hit, run, ambush, attack, Run, leave, a, leave a place to run and then lay your ambush. Both British and Patriot forces in South Carolina were racially integrated, with African-American soldiers serving in the ranks. Some may have been freedmen, most were probably slaves. One black soldier in Marion's brigade was Oscar Marion, Francis Marion's lifelong companion and body servant, who took Marion's last name. Described as selfless and devoted to American independence, he reportedly fought alongside Marion throughout the entire war, sometimes in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In late August of 1780, 
Mary had learned that a large force of Loyalist militia was posted to a place called Black Mingo Creek, which was located about 20 miles northwest of Georgetown. The Loyalist troops were encamped around a country tavern, relaxing in the belief that no Patriot forces were nearby. They were commanded by a wealthy low country planter and slave owner, Captain John Cumming Ball, Marion struck the Loyalist encampment at Black Mingo from three directions. The surprised Loyalist panicked and fled into the nearby swamp. Marion's victory at Black Mingo severely weakened Loyalist opposition in the lower PD region, boosted Marion's reputation as a guerrilla leader, and more. He captured Captain Ball's treasured thoroughbred horse, which he named Ball, and rode throughout the remainder of the war. A week after Black Mingo, while Marion rested in the faraway swampland of the PD, on a rocky wooded hillside just southwest of Charlotte, the British Southern strategy was dealt an unexpected and disastrous blow. Confident that he had conquered South Carolina, General Cornwallis led a large British army into North Carolina, brushed aside light opposition and established temporary headquarters in the hamlet of Charlotte. The left flank of Cornwallis's army was anchored atop King's Mountain by an 1,100-man force of Loyalist troops commanded by a bold, experienced British officer, Major Patrick Ferguson. As he moved his Loyalist troops through the South Carolina upcountry to support Cornwallis, Ferguson had sent a warning to the frontier settlements in the mountains of North Carolina and eastern Tennessee, threatening to march his troops into the mountains and burn the homes of anyone who opposed the king. The hickory-hard Scots-Irish mountaineers believed him, and instead of waiting for Ferguson to make good on his threat, they decided to come after him. Calling themselves the Over-Mountain Men, 1,000 rifle-toting volunteers from the hollows of the Blue Ridge Mountains marched for a hundred miles until they caught up with Ferguson and his loyalists on the slopes of Kings Mountain. There, on October 7, 1780, they shot Major Ferguson dead and destroyed his force of loyalist troops, wrecking Cornwallis's left flank and forcing the general to postpone his invasion of North Carolina. Well, that was one of those critical battles uh, in the fall of 1780 that helped put resolve and backbone into the backcountry resistance and, and painted the picture that, yes, we can resist these British. The victory at King's Mountain bolstered the morale of Patriot Americans everywhere including Francis Marion and his men. A few weeks after King's Mountain, a force of approximately 200 Loyalists were encamped here at a place called Tearcoat Swamp, which lies a few miles north of the modern town of Manning in South Carolina's Clarendon County. Today, near the Clarendon County Courthouse in Manning, outdoor murals celebrate Francis Marion as a local hero by depicting key events in Marion's campaigns. Again, Marion was outnumbered, but again, his surprise attack worked, and the Loyalists fled up the road into the surrounding swamps, fields, and forests. And I think that's what was key about Marion, is he kept that struggle going on, giving it time for more and more of these things to happen, so that the Patriots' numbers kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. General Cornwallis was convinced that Francis Marion had to be stopped, and he believed he knew the man who could do it. His name was Bannister Tarleton, a 26-year-old red-headed British lieutenant colonel, educated at Oxford, son of the mayor of Liverpool. A youthful gambler, he had lost his inheritance and had sought his fortune in the British Army. He had led troops in the war's northern theater but had failed to make a name for himself. 
That changed when Tarlington came to South Carolina as commander of the British Legion or Green Dragoons, troops who could fight as cavalry or mounted infantry and were nicknamed for the green uniform tunics they wore. Here, at the site of this roadside memorial in South Carolina's Waxhaws community between Lancaster and Pageland, Bannister Tarlington became infamous as the most hated and feared British officer in South Carolina. Along this road on May 29, 1780, a force of some 300 Continental troops from Virginia under Colonel Abraham Buford were hurriedly fleeing toward North Carolina after the fall of Charleston and were overtaken here by Tarleton and his Green Dragoon. At first, the Virginians attempted to fight. Then they attempted to surrender. Only, it was reported, to be sabered and bayoneted by Tarleton's troops. The bloody action became known among Patriot Americans as Beaufort's Massacre or the Waxhaws Massacre. Whether it was a massacre or a battle, as the British claimed, the casualties were dramatically one-sided. 113 Virginians killed and buried in a mass grave. Tarlington's casualties numbered 19. Tarlington's quarter became the Patriot battle cry in South Carolina, and Bannister Tarlington would forever be known as Bloody Ban. When he came in to fight, he didn't really consider these people worthy opponents. He considered them rebels, and as far as he was concerned, if they didn't want to fight on gentlemen's terms like he was trained to do, then they weren't being gentlemen fighters and they didn't deserve quarter. view of Tarleton is that he was a cruel military officer. Whether it's true or not, it depends on whose accounts you're looking at. But from the Patriot side, he was someone who would slaughter the enemy after the enemy had given up. Less than two weeks after Francis Marion's victory at Terracote Swamp, Bloody Ban Tarlington and his Green Dragoons set out from Charleston to locate and wipe out Marion and his men. At the time, Marion and some of his troops were encamped on the upper Santee River, about 25 miles west of Manning, near this site then the plantation of General Richard Richardson, an elderly Patriot officer who had died two months earlier and whose home on this site was occupied by his widow. Not far away on the river road near a place called Halfway Swamp, Marion tried to set an ambush for Tarlington after learning of his approach. He failed to make contact this time, however, and withdrew into the swamps to the east. And in retaliation, Tarlington drove the Richardson's livestock into their barn, then set it afire, along with the widow's home. Although conclusive proof is lacking, post-war accounts claim that Tarlington also ordered his dragoons to haul General Richardson's body from its grave in the family cemetery. Afterward, Tarlington and his green dragoons left Richardson's plantation in a determined pursuit of Marion, racing their horses through the forest and swamps of what is now Clarendon County, with Marion and his men always just out of reach. The fox hunt, uh, the hounds, in this case the British, en masse fall in behind a single weekly foe in an environment that they should be able to overpower. The hound, the British force, is stronger. He has greater numbers. He's better fed. He's better equipped. There's no reason why he can't run down and catch a little small foe, the fox, and in this case, Marion's small group of men. But the reason why the fox wins is because the fox knows which hole to duck under. He knows which tree to, to climb. He knows uh, which creek to swim and which to ford, and he gets out ahead. Tarlington's wild pursuit of Marion went on for more than 25 miles until Tarlington finally called a halt here at Ox Swamp, just outside modern Manning. He would not enter one more swamp, Tarlington decided. As he called off the chase, he reportedly yelled into the dark thickets of Ox Swamp, come on my boys, let's go back. As for this damned old fox, the devil himself could not catch him. Thus was born the legend of the Swamp Fox.
Marion's guerrilla style tactic was to strike with a surprise attack, then withdraw to a hiding place in the swamps. He had several hideouts during the revolution, the most famous at a place called Snow's Island. Located in what is now the southeast corner of Florence County, near the modern town of Johnsonville, Snow's Island was an isolated wilderness island of swamps and forests surrounded by the Great P.D. River, Lynch's River, and Clark's Creek. To the east, about 20 miles west of modern Conway, lay the community of Britain's Neck a Scots-Irish bastion of patriot support that provided Marion with many of his soldiers and much of his supplies. Snow's Island was his secure base camp, and it's, a, it's an island about three miles uh, long by two miles wide. Gorillas need a place they can go off to, and that was a place you could go off to. Surrounded again by the people, strong people who would support, who would warn you if someone was coming. The only access to Snow's Island was by water, by crossing the Great P.D. River or the other two waterways that surrounded the island. And Marion, who reportedly could not swim, repeatedly ferried his men and horses across the rivers. Those creeks aren't easy to cross, and yet they did. If you ever go to the P.D. at where that water's rolling, and it would have been dangerous to cross, and yet they did. The cypress swamps and bogs and, and, and low country rivers and creeks here would have, would have looked uh, not unlike they look today, except they would have been much larger trees. They were ways to get in and around these swampy uh, areas and be able to cut off and get to, get, get to where you wanted to go without being bogged down. If you were a foreigner and didn't know that and you just tried to follow along uh, haphazardly, you wouldn't get very far. In the wilderness isolation of Snow's Island, Marion and his troops had a measure of security where the men could enjoy a fleeting interlude of relaxation from the tensions of warfare, repair clothing, equipment, and weapons, rest their horses, replenish supplies, and prepare to strike again. The common ration on Snow's Island was low country sweet potatoes baked in the coals of a campfire and washed down with river water. According to legend, Marion once had a captured British officer at his Snow's Island camp and shared a sweet potato dinner with his royal prisoner. When released, the British officer reportedly lamented to his superiors that after sampling the sustenance on which Marion's men lived and fought, he was convinced that defeating the South Carolinians would be impossible. While on Snow's Island in late 1780, Marion learned that South Carolina Governor John Rutledge had notified the Continental Congress that he was commissioning Marion as a Brigadier General. From the safety of his camps on Snow's Island, General Marion recruited more troops and planned more operations, attacking a column of British recruits at Halfway Swamp on the Santee River, sending raiders to attack British wagon trains on the isolated wagon road from Charleston to Camden, capturing supplies, taking prisoners, dispersing Loyalist troops, constantly undermining the British Southern strategy in South Carolina. Marion keeping the war going and going and making it necessary for them, for the British to be in South Carolina was really the best thing that Marion could do because the British kept hurting themselves by being so harsh and turning the local people against them by doing things that the local people considered cruel. A principal target of choice for Francis Marion was here, the port city of Georgetown, third oldest city in South Carolina second most important port in the state, and Francis Marion's childhood home. The British had seized and fortified Georgetown just six weeks after capturing Charleston, 
and Marion desperately wanted to liberate the town and its inhabitants. In November of 1780, he attacked British and Loyalist troops at two places on the edge of town, but the British had reinforced the garrison at Georgetown and the defenders repulsed Marion's attacks. Through the Carolina forest and swampland, British troops and Loyalist militia continued to pursue Marion, and he continued to elude them. Some of his men, however, were caught. At a roadside tavern here on the banks of Lynch's River on the outskirts of modern-day Johnsonville, a half dozen of Marion's men were surprised by a large force of Loyalists in early 1781. Trapped and outnumbered, they agreed to throw down their weapons and surrender. And when they did, all were promptly shot dead in what became known as the Lynch's River Massacre. In January of 1781, in the South Carolina upcountry, at a rural cattle grazing area called Calpins, Francis Marion and South Carolina's other guerrilla fighters received another boost comparable to the victory at Kings Mountain. Patriot forces in the South now had a new commander, Major General Nathaniel Green, sent South to lead the war by General George Washington. Next to Washington, Green was probably the most competent officer in the Continental Army. I think he's a great leader. Marion and uh, Ori and the other officers in our, our PD area uh, thought very highly of him. Green's goal in the Carolinas was to lead General Cornwallis and his British Army out of South Carolina, deplete his forces by constant fighting, and leave the remaining British troops in South Carolina weakened and vulnerable to attack. Cornwallis took the bait and resumed his invasion of North Carolina. At Green's direction, meanwhile, one of his ablest officers, Brigadier General Daniel Morgan, lured Lieutenant Colonel Tarlington and 1,100 British troops away from Cornwallis's main force and into a well-conceived ambush in the pasture lands of Calpins. It was a humiliating British defeat. Tarlington's casualties outnumbered Morgan's four to one and Tarlington personally fled the battlefield at a gallop, barely escaping capture. The victory at Calpins reinvigorated patriot morale throughout the nation, turned the tide of war in South Carolina, and reinvigorated Francis Marion's operations against the British. As Green led Cornwallis and his British army on a draining campaign across North Carolina, he sent Marion reinforcements led by one of the best commanders in the Continental Army, Major Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee. One of George Washington's most valued, experienced, and trusted officers, and the future father of Civil War General Robert E. Lee, young Lighthorse Harry Lee brought Lee's legion with him, an experienced, disciplined, and capable unit of cavalry and mounted infantry. With their joint forces, Marion and Lee moved against the British post in Georgetown, which were located not far from the town's landmark Prince George Winyon Church. They managed to capture the city's British commander, Lieutenant Colonel George Campbell. But to Marion's dismay, the British garrison withdrew to a new strong fortification, Fort Winyon overlooking the Sand Pit River on this side at the edge of town, and they refused to either come out and fight or to try to rescue their captured commander. Unequipped to besiege the fort, Marion and Lee withdrew, leaving the British still in control of Georgetown. Marion returned to his hideouts on Snows Island. Lee and his troops joined General Greene's army in North Carolina, and General Marion stepped up his raids now with several hundred men under his command. British troops in South Carolina were increasingly unnerved and frustrated just to hear the name Francis Marion. Uh, it would have had a, a devastating psychological impact on that British line soldier to know that uh, my enemy is 
more skilled at this fight than I am, knows this terrain better because he grew up here, he hunts here, he fishes here, he farms here, he knows all the back ways, he knows all the shortcuts, and when I get lost in this wilderness, he's gonna be right at home, and he's gonna be right on my tail. In early 1781, General Cornwallis and his British Army set out on a forced march across North Carolina in pursuit of General Greene's Continental Forces. Left behind to occupy South Carolina were the 8,000 British troops commanded by Brigadier General Francis Rawdon, an Oxford-educated, combat-tested career British officer. In March of 1781, Rawdon unleashed two forces of British and Loyalist troops against Marion, both ordered to find Marion or converge on Snows Island. One force was led by Colonel Wilbur Doyle, and followed the road that ran alongside the P.D. River. The other set out from the west, looking for Marion along the Santee River Road. It was commanded by Colonel John Watson and included Watson's highly regarded British Third Foot Guards. Marion was alerted by his scouts and engaged Watson's troops at a place called Waibu Swamp, which now lies under Lake Marion. It was a brief, fierce hand-to-hand -hand skirmish that stalled Watson's advance, but the British commander had brought field artillery with him, which drove off Marion and his men. Watson trailed Marion into Williamsburg County, where Marion struck twice at Mount Hope Swamp and at Lower Bridge spanning the Black River near modern King Street. At the bridge, Watson attempted to use his artillery again, but this time Marion was prepared and he turned loose a force of 30 hand-picked sharpshooters armed with hunting rifles who picked off Watson's gun crews and put the British into a retreat. Colonel Watson had had enough, and he put his British and Loyalist troops on a forced march to the safety of Georgetown. But now, the hunter had become the hunted. At the Sam Pitt River Bridge west of Georgetown, Marion had Peter Ory burn the bridge then again unleashed sharpshooters on British and Loyalists while they attempted to ford the river. Twenty British were killed, about 40 more were wounded, while Marion lost one man. But at the moment of triumph, he received shocking news. On March 29th, the other British force, Colonel Wilbur Doyle and 900 British and Loyalist troops, had located Marion's base camp on Snow's Island and had destroyed it. Then the tide of war shifted in Marion's favor. Continental dragoons arrived with a dramatic dispatch. General Greene was returning to South Carolina with his army, and he wanted Marion to join him for joint operations. After leading Cornwallis and his British army on an exhausting pursuit across North Carolina, Greene and his army had turned on the pursuers at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in March of 1781. It had been a tactical British victory, but Cornwallis's army had been so battered and depleted that he had retreated to the North Carolina coast. Then he had turned and marched north to Virginia leaving Colonel Rawdon and his 8,000 British and Loyalist troops to defend South Carolina. Greene promptly moved against Rawdon and the British garrison at Camden, fighting the Battle of Hobkirk's Hill on April 25, 1781. Again, it was a tactical British victory, but British losses were so great that Rawdon abandoned Camden, setting it on fire, and retreated to Charleston. Meanwhile, at Greene's direction, Marion and Light Horse Harry Lee's combined forces attacked a British outpost on the upper Santee River called Fort Watson, located on a site that now overlooks Lake Marion, southwest of Manning. Unable to breach or scale Fort Watson's high earthen wall, Lee and Marion managed to capture the fort by building a wooden tower that provided a deck for sharpshooters to fire into the fort. In early May of 1781, Marion and Lee attacked another British outpost, Fort Mott, which was located south of modern-day Columbia. Again, they were successful. 
the 150-man British garrison was forced to surrender. After the battle, Marion learned that Lee's men were hanging some of the prisoners, including the man who had guided the British to Snow's Island. He was captured and hung at Fort Mott. He was one of the loyalists that were hung there. So uh, they picked him out of the crowd. They said, there's Hugh Maskelly, and they dragged him out of the, out of the prison pen. Marion was furious and put a stop to the executions in time to save several lives. In May of 1781, Francis Marion again attempted to liberate Georgetown. Again, the British garrison retreated to Fort Winyard, but Marion besieged the fort, having his troops advance through trenches they dug. To avoid capture, the British garrison abandoned Fort Winyard and fled to British ships anchored in Georgetown Harbor. Finally, Francis Marion had achieved his goal of liberating Georgetown but it was a bitter victory. After he and most of his troops had left town, the British came back ashore and set fire to the town, burning Georgetown to the ground. In August of 1781, Francis Marion led 200 troops on a hard ride to Parker's Ferry, west of Charleston, and boldly divided his troops to ambush and defeat a larger force of British and Loyalists. He put himself between two British forces with his back to a river. Um, and had the British been able to coordinate their attack against him, he would have been trapped. Um, and, and yet he set up an ambush between two forces and defeated them piecemeal. In September of 1781, Marion joined General Greene's army here at the Battle of Utah Springs, where Greene's 2,000 troops attacked an equal-sized British army northwest of Charleston. With the help of Marion and others, Greene had pushed the British across South Carolina to the gates of Charleston. He had done so by depleting British forces without winning a single battle and he did the same again at Utah Springs. It was a tactical victory for the British, but it left them so weakened that they gave up inland South Carolina and retreated into Charleston. In Virginia, meanwhile, General Cornwallis's army was trapped at Yorktown when Washington led French and American troops on a forced march from New York and besieged Cornwallis's army with the support of the French Navy. Washington accepted the surrender of Cornwallis' army on October 19, 1781. Although no more major battles were fought in America after Yorktown, it would be almost two years before a peace treaty would be signed to end the revolution, and bloody skirmishing still continued off and on in South Carolina. In February of 1782, here at Wombaugh Creek near the Santee River Delta south of Georgetown, 700 British and Loyalist troops surprised and defeated Francis Marion's force. Marion had been elected to the South Carolina Senate and was at the General Assembly when he learned of the raid. He raced to reach his troops, but he was too late and they were defeated. Marion's last combat of the Revolution occurred in the summer of 1782 a classic Marion-style ambush in the woods of Wadbu Barony in what is now Francis Marion National Forest near Monk's Corner. There, he surprised and defeated a raiding force of 100 British dragoons on a mission to catch or kill the Swamp Fox. A more meaningful personal end of the war for Francis Marion occurred here in the Bowling Green community off modern U.S. Highway 501 in what is now Marion County, here near a small rural church at a site unnoticed today, Francis Marion received the surrender of his longtime enemy, Major Micah Gajani, and his loyalist troops, 500 in all, who lined up and laid down their arms. In November of 1782, the Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia officially proclaimed a national day of prayer. In their words, a day of solemn thanksgiving to God for his mercies, because British and American officials in Paris had finally agreed to peace terms. 
The treaty would not be officially signed until the following September, but in December of 1782, the British Army boarded troop ships and left Charleston, along with 4,000 South Carolina loyalists. The war was finally over. South Carolina had been liberated. America had won its independence, and Francis Marion finally went home. His plantation at Pond Bluff, which ironically would be covered by Lake Marion in the 20th century, had been raided, looted, and left in ruins by the British, and Brigadier General Francis Marion was penniless. His troops rallied one more time and rebuilt his home, and the South Carolina legislature, on behalf of grateful South Carolinians, gave him command of Fort Johnson in Charleston Harbor and a salary to go with it. He served in the state senate for three terms, and when some proposed punishment of former loyalists, Marion urged reconciliation. God has given us the victory, he said. Let us show our gratitude to heaven, which we shall not do by cruelty to man. Francis Marion's significant role in the revolution in South Carolina was to keep the war going and keep up resistance against the British so that the British could take South Carolina and then move to another area. In the long run, I think that was a significant thing that led to the ultimate defeat of the British. If it hadn't been for Francis Marion's role here with local soldiers, local farmers, uh, going to fight and fighting to defend their homes there, uh, I don't think the American Revolution would have ended nearly as quickly and probably wouldn't have ended in the way that it did end. At age 54, Francis Marion finally married to Mary Esther Vidot and lived quietly on his plantation until his death at age 62 in 1795. He left no heirs, but he was revered and remembered by his fellow South Carolinians. And 15 years after his death, he became a national hero. In 1805, a biography of Marion was published based on a manuscript by his longtime friend and fellow officer, Peter Ory. But Peter Ory's book agent, Mason Locke Weems, a shameless inventor of tall tales, rewrote Ory's work and added extensive, fanciful, and dramatic inventions. He takes Ory's History of Marion's Brigade and in that famous line says, knowing the passion for novels, I have dressed the story in the garb of a military romance. Ori writes back, tis not my history, but your romance. Despite Mason Weems' fanciful exaggeration, enough of Peter Ori's profile of Francis Marion came through to make the book an early American bestseller. The story of Francis Marion and the American Revolution inspired the nation. From South Carolina to South Dakota, 17 counties and 29 towns would be named Marion. And from South Carolina's Lake Marion to Marion Lake in Oregon, bodies of water throughout America were christened in honor of South Carolina Swamp Fox. He represents that strength against oppression a part of that American story. He fits well into that sort of story. He's someone we can hold up high. Today, those searching for the grave of Francis Marion, South Carolina's most prominent Revolutionary War hero, will find it in a remote corner of South Carolina's Berkeley County, in a historic, lonely family cemetery, isolated and far from modern population centers. The secluded, humble setting would likely be greeted with approval by the quiet and reserved hero it commemorates, a common-looking man of uncommon ability who was willing to sacrifice all to secure the American people's inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox of the Revolution.